For more than 20 years, Barbara wrote, in the weekly ad week, wrote the weekly Ad Week Critique, and for the past four years, originally under the pen name Dorothy Parker, she has written the closely followed Mad Blog column for Media Post, an inspired, detailed review of every episode of Mad Men during the season. I know you all know that. In her new role at, at the company, she joins Media Post as editor at large. Please join me in welcoming Andrew and Barbara to the stage. Well, got a mic. Two yeah, mics. we're mic. So this is dangerous. The, it's the it's the lavalier versus the, you know, rock star. Go with what you like. Yeah. So you are like a rock star, right? You're like left brain, right brain. You can be a CEO and a musician and a creative. Um, it's very interesting and it's kind of unusual that you know for an agency as loud and successful as Crispin um, to draw on a former art director and creative director to be its CEO. And that happened three years ago when? It was about two years ago. Thank two. you, I've got Katie giving me answers from yeah. the front row. Thank two. you, Katie. Um, and it must have been especially hard because Alex Boguski was literally considered not only God, but Jesus Christ. I mean, Fast Company <laughs> actually called him Jesus Christ on the front page, and they were not kidding. So imagine stepping into Jesus' sandals and becoming CEO after you're a creative director. How did you do that? That's a huge question, Barbara. <laughs> Let's break it down. I don't know if we down. have time for all that. Um, it was tough. I mean, it was, a, it, was a scary, it was a scary moment in time for sure. I mean, Alex was a huge influence. We had big clients. We've got to do big work. Um, you know, really the focus was just to um, keep doing what we were doing and try to make the best work that we could. Uh, and it really came down to empowering a lot of people because we had, why am I using this mic? No, I like it too. You it's like okay. it? Yeah. Does this work as well? It came down to really empowering people uh, in a big way because we had to create a really broad uh, sense of talent that could go in and work with all these clients and make great things happen. So, you know, that was really the first thing um, that we started to do and we just had to keep building and building How hard was it with the clients you had at the time? Because Alex, you know, basically a lot of the agency was built on the fact that you made headlines no matter what you did. Right. Um, and that's a lot of what they were buying into and a lot of what they were buying into was Alex Boguski's brain, I guess. Yeah. Fortunately, whether they knew it or not, they were also buying a little bit into my brain. So <laughs> they had to, you know, for the clients, they knew you know, who their people were, and they'd worked with me a lot, and they'd worked with Rob Riley a lot. And so um, it wasn't too uh, you know, big of a change for them, in fact. So it, you know, it worked out great. We just had to keep delivering for them. I mean, probably the bigger challenge was you know, what happened to the economy at that time. That was, I mean, the industry began to really change, and the economy began to really change. And when I started, we had lost the Volkswagen account three months or so before the end of the year that I began, so and that, that was, was challenging. Um, and so, you know, those were the things that I was um, dealing with um, as well as with uh, uh, Alex, but that was probably less of a, less and, of an issue. And, and internal, the internal culture, since you had been in place <clears throat> and Rob had been in place then for employees, that, yeah. that's how that worked. Yeah, that, I, I think that went, you know, that went well. We just had to, I just had to communicate a lot. It took a lot of communication. Town halls and weekly updates and things just to make sure that, you know, everybody knew. I even started wearing a blazer and stuff like that. Yeah, to show that you're in command. Yeah, because most people think I'm like a 14-year-old kid or something. And yeah. so that doesn't really breed a lot of confidence. You do look very young. How old are you, if I may ask? How old are you? It's, I want to be that guy on, you know, It's the what they came guy. to find out. Uh, 42. Yeah. That, that's a commanding age. It's yeah. a good age. Uh, um, so you mentioned that you stepped in at a very challenging time, not only with the agency, but with the economy. And I think there's not an agency alive that isn't feeling, uh, you know, the tremendous struggle of adapting to technology that changes every instant and the idea that the TV dollars are gone and how are they going to be replaced and the whole model is up for grabs. Um, what do you see as, you know, how to sustain 
revenue and you know build on what you have? Well, you've got to come up with a leaner model for starters because there's just not going to be as much money. I mean, we've seen clients' budgets be cut in more than half. Um, and so you have to be more lean. You have to invest in the future. I mean, we got into digital a long time ago. You know, and that makes up a large part of what we do, and, and that's What, what percentage that's growing. would you say? Is Probably about 40%. Um, in terms of number of projects, it'd be more than that, but in terms of dollars, it's probably, you know, more around 40% or so, something yeah, like that. Yeah, that's great. So, you know, that's something that we've been doing for a long time that we feel very comfortable in. And then we just look for other ways to add legs to the stool. I mean, we've gotten involved in production. You know, we produce you know, our, all our digital work in-house. I was so, going to ask that. Now that you're in Colorado, you know, it's... It, Started out as a really one agency town. You built your own production services and studios, and we're working on it. We've really started it more um, in terms of video production in LA, but then we we spread those um, folks around to come work uh, in Boulder and in Miami as well. So we do production and digital production. We have lots of digital production happening in Boulder. Um, so. Yeah, that's something that we had to do. But we were used to that. In Miami, it was a very kind of DIY attitude. You know, I had worked in Portland a long time ago, and there were just great photographers, you know, roaming the streets. And in Miami, you know, we had to really do a lot of things ourselves. It was a kind of an in-house mentality that, that I think made the work better. I mean, we found with digital, the only way to do great work is to do the work because there's Yourselves. so much. Yeah, there's so much in the creating of it, and there's so much in the... You know, well, I don't know if we can do that, or I don't know, we can't do that for the money or in the time. And the yeah, and the meetings, the endless meetings with 20 people on the phone, whereas you can reduce that in the translation of what you need. And yeah, we haven't reduced the number of people involved, but yeah, <laughs> but um, but we're able to do more, I think. Well, um, so how does that work internally then? Um, since you were such a pioneer in the digital world. How did the, the, you know, at the time Mad Men started, it was a revolution to have an art director and a writer together. You know, the, originally the writer slipped the stuff under the door for the art director, that's what they said. Now, do you have teams that include art directors, writers, and technologists, or is it not any division at all? Everybody does everything? We, you know, we have so many different types of brains within the agency, and we want, and every different type of brain, whether you're a designer, or you're an experienced designer, or whether you're a developer, you know, you bring a different attitude and philosophy to a problem. So we try to engage all the brains. You know, within the art director and copywriter, we'll add a UX person. Um, we'll add uh, a, a creative technologist to the group as well. So those groups exist, and then they just keep getting, you know, built out as the as the project progresses. So a producer and more and more. So. Right. So that the, there's basically no distinction. And when you talk about say, uh, you know, uh, all of the facets of a technology campaign, you know, if you're building it across all points, right. and you you just build in the budget for mobile for. You know, those yeah, I don't know if it's always built in, into the budget, but we definitely like do all those components. Um, for everything. Know. Yeah, I mean, you've got to, there has to be a mobile component um, to, whatever you're, to whatever you're working on um, these days, or you're just kind of leaving an opportunity on yeah, the table. Yeah, and I, I guess the, yeah, the problem, there's so much beautiful work being done in mobile, but the, you know, as they say, it's, it's TV dollars and digital dimes and mobile fractions of pennies. True. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the, there's a lot of apps being built, you know, for better or for worse. I mean, that, that's some of the things that we've been, um, we've been doing a lot of that as well, which I think is, you know, very, is, is in the mobile space in the Actually, big way. Actually, yeah, we do have, um, well, we have two interesting pieces that we wanted to talk about. Um, first of all, I guess it was like three or four months ago when General Motors announced that they were never advertised on Facebook. Right. And you've had tremendous success on Facebook. We love Facebook. Say? Yeah. Um, so I guess you would disagree <laughs> with that. I mean, we're headed toward the Great Poupon um, campaign, which got a lot of attention <laughs> because it basically you know, said, are you good enough for Great Poupon, which fit exactly into the brand structure from the, the role, dual Royce I like Rolls how you're Royces. pronouncing it, like Poupon. Poupon. Well, yeah. that's why I took the test and they and accepted passed, me. And you passed, obviously. Yes. You did Yes, but I was angry because I'm only in the 81st percentile and I wanted to be like 98. And I'm like, you see what it's looking at on your Facebook page? And, no, no, I went to a better restaurant than that. Why are you using that one? You know? Well, I say Poupon and I okay. was not accepted. So. 
Oh. Let it um, be known. But actually, let's, let's just look at that piece of video uh, on Great Poupon. I feel like I'm on the Letterman. We're going to watch the thing. Is it coming? Um, we're changing up the, the <laughs> order a little, so it might be a while. But. I can talk about the other one as well. Search. Oh, here it is. The sound. <laughs> the mission to it's definitely better with sound. We dusted off our tuxedos and prepared for our grand re-entrance into society. Our first stop, Facebook. To help establish our voice, we created a colorful 233-year brand history and began posting tasteful trivia, recipes, and tasteful tips daily. Then we launched the Grape Poupon Twitter feed and a brand new site housed entirely on Pinterest. We were now prepared to welcome an onslaught of adoring fans. However, where most brands sought billions of fans, we were going to be selective. If you wanted the honor of liking us on Facebook, you'd have to apply. It was an audacious move, but on September 12th, the Society of Good Taste, the world's first members-only Facebook page, went live. The New York Times broke the story, and suddenly it was everywhere. And while many applied, 14,000 with dubious taste have already been denied. Oh, poor chap. The internet flooded with reactions. Our Pinterest followers jumped 800% practically overnight. The social landscape had transformed. In just a flash, we'd gone from barely part of the conversation to hosting it. We have people's attention. They're waiting, wondering, will we snuff out the candelabras and stable the polo ponies? Or will we keep our Italian leather wingtips planted firmly on the gas? Okay, <laughs> clever, spread good taste. So, it's over so, the top. And, and let's face it, it what cost almost nothing? Or? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it takes some time. There's a lot of work to do to figure out all the scraping. You know, there's about 20 different categories and 500 keywords within each category that we're looking for. You know, whether you um, like the English patient uh, as a movie or whether um, you like the thong song, you know, that's not good. Uh, if, you use, if you use text language, text speak, that's not good either. So, you know, we're looking for all those sorts of things. So it takes a lot of background to weed out your CEO, as yeah, far as I can it, tell. It, <laughs> exactly. So where do you go from, you know, the weed out now that you have your... I've got to go, now that I've asked about this, I can just sort of send a bunch of posts that have the right words in it and, and you know, go to the right restaurants and then reapply. Yeah, no, well, not you individually, but your, oh. your client. <laughs> <laughs> It's not about Your brand. This isn't about me. Yeah. Well, th this is just the beginning for the brand. You know, I think it's a great, it's a great way for the brand to begin with this point of view that can, I think, simultaneously. Well, it's a wonderful way of telling a story. Yeah. Effortlessly, you know. Totally. Digitally. Well, I think it's a great. It's fun too because they're kind of able to bring back this notion of manners and civility, which I think everybody's kind of wondering, could that come back? Would that please come back? Um, but do it all with a sense of humor so it's not taking itself too seriously. But, but it's able to do it through an action. And then you remember that and you feel that and you talk to people about that. You well, know, you really are now. personalizing, pardon me. You know, yeah. you had no idea whether you could ride in the back of the rolls. That's right. Or not. And you could. And Absolutely. I and, and I wouldn't give anyone else my, I wouldn't lend it. <laughs> no, no. Pardon me. No. Um, well, you know, there's so much interesting um, Technolo technological work that you're doing that we could show endless stuff, but the, one of the brand's stories that I found really interesting, you turned it around, and I was really wrong about it when I critiqued it, was Domino's Pizza. Oh. Um, at first, when it first happened, and you know, I was a New York snob, and Domino's, you know, I'd rather eat the cardboard than, you know, <laughs> that it came on, and I couldn't understand why anyone would want it, and you actually opened it all, made it completely transparent, and said you're making it better. And I wrote yeah. a critique that said, oh yeah, that's gonna work. Oh, I didn't see that. And then later on I wrote a, you know, I'm sorry I was wrong. And I turned it around, yeah, mea culpa. That's right, um, I do So that. if you could just sort of, we, we're gonna show one of the latest apps, but there've been tons of them. Um, can you walk us through how you turned Domino's yeah. around? 
Yeah, you know, it was interesting. Domino's was really famous for uh, delivery, um, and that was this kind of magic component of who they were. And we had started to try to do a campaign that played off of that, uh, and that, you know, it didn't really work. I mean, people's values had changed, and they wanted to know who was making their food. I mean, the best food, I think, is, is food made by someone that you know and that you trust and that you love. And so, you know, we looked at it and we realized, wow, the magic of delivery, the fact that like you just call a number and this thing shows up and you don't know where it came from or who made it or what, could actually be in the way of you believing that this pizza is great. So we realized we had to have a bigger, stronger connection with the consumer and that we had to be much more transparent and then, so at the same time, we had the new and improved pizza coming out, and we realized that we were going to have to kind of uh, own up to something, and we were going to have to, in order to kind of what I, what I call it, create a pathway to credibility, because we could say, we got a new pizza, but why should anyone believe it? Yeah, and that's true. I never really thought about that, but if every client, if every brand uses new and improved, they're saying that whatever was before was, you know, a bit shitty. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah. It's true. And, you know, we weren't saying it. Other people, you know, we had, it was being said all over the place. There was no way to avoid it. That's where, you know, ultimately you had no choice but to, of social to kind of media. face it. Because of social media. And that was, you know, that was part of it. I mean, Domino's had had an incident that almost every company has had now on social media where people were doing things in the kitchen. And that was when we realized, you know, we weren't prepared from a digital standpoint to be able to respond, and we had to change. Is that the way the right when you got the account? When that happened? That was no. That was, I don't know. It, we'd had the account before that. Oh, you know, okay. For sure. Well, if I could just go into detail about that, there was yeah. an employee who put a video on YouTube, and it showed the employee applying certain foodstuffs to his nose. That would then go into one of the submarine sandwiches or yeah. something. So that, there's, there's something ideal. that makes everyone quiet immediately. You know, yes. It's a crowd killer. Um, so we so, were dealing with that at the same time, but it was kind of good because it forced us to realize we had to have a digital presence and we had right. to have a way to communicate with the people that knew Domino's and loved Domino's and people that didn't like Domino's. We had to have a pathway there. So um, that really opened us up to kind of new ways of engaging the consumer. So what was the first digital Well, so at, at that time, really, um, the first, I'm just getting all over the place now, the first digital breakthrough, I think, for Domino's was Pizza Tracker. Because we found out that they had all this information about when the pizza was made, who it was made by, where it was going, um, but no one knew it. It was for their own purposes, just to be able to keep tabs on folks. And we said, well, let's, we can skin that out for the world. So we took all that technology and we put a skin on it and called it Pizza Tracker. So that now everybody could see where their pizza was, who had made it, when it's coming, and actually who was delivering it um, to your door. So you know, that set up, uh, you know, that changed the relationship in a huge way because now, even though there were still secrets, Pizza Tracker brought them to light and you knew who was bringing it. And people would test it and they'd say, Susie's going to bring it to the door. And so, sure enough, Susie showed up with the pizza. Wow. And then you could review the pizza at the same time um, on that site. And then later we took those reviews and we put the pizza tracker up in Times Square, not too far from here. And we posted all those reviews. And we would always post you know, all kinds of reviews, no matter what uh, anybody said. Um, so some of them were really negative? Sure, some were, yeah, there were negative ones as well. And you know, once, you, once your position is about, we're, gonna, we're working on this, we're getting better, and, we, and you are going to make us better with your criticism, then all those comments are, are great because you're, it's part of who your brand is. And then you use some of those comments in turn for your TV work. Yeah, so then that became um, the sort of impetus for how we would go to market with uh, the television to bring that up. And then we actually went back to some of the people you know, that, that were in the, um, that had been in the focus group saying things. We went back to them and asked them to taste the pizza again. So um, it was a lot of fun. So it just kept, it just kept going and going. And now, um, yeah, we, we you want me to, to talk about the latest the, app that yeah, we're going to so Yeah, so we've got an app now on iPad. And, you know, one of the first things we did was try to make making the pizza more fun. Um, and so we really went crazy on this app because we thought, you know, most people don't know how Domino's makes the pizza still. And, and we were like, you what picture, if they think... You know, like I picture like, you know, 900 pound vats and... 
Yeah, yeah or like yeah. just a frozen pizza that you put into right. a microwave or something. You know, people just didn't know, and we thought, well, let's bring this to life. Everybody loves making pizzas, so we did an iPad app where you could actually make the pizza with your hands, and you push the dough and all this sort of stuff. And we thought that would give people a good sense. And then the other fun thing was. Um, people that were good at it, we would start offering them jobs. So we've actually given a few people jobs based on their performance wow. let's, let's look at on the, the Pizza Hero app. That's amazing. How many jobs? Three that I know of. Wow. <laughs> so it translates from digital to real life. Yeah, because all making. this is the real way they do it and it's timed. No, but you um, can tell from the digital hand that it would be good in the real world. <laughs> <laughs> and what's the scoring based on? Uh, speed and accuracy. Uh, of putting toppings on? Yeah. And then slicing it. <laughs> and it's all it. with your finger? Boxing it, yeah. And is it only an iPad app? These are Domino's yep. pizza. And then you can order any of the pizzas you make, you can order and they'll be delivered. Um, and then, and this app was number three in the app store ahead of Skype. That's when I was like, whoa. Wow, so I a lot of Skype. people at home making. Yeah, people are going crazy for it. My kids really Yeah, thought making it was great. a pizza every night. That, well, that's they a really make, good way to. Yeah, keep to, them busy. Yeah, well, also, <laughs> you know, your kids force you to order it then. Exactly. Yeah. And they love, my kids love Domino's. And, our family loves Domino's. So. Uh, I'm sure. We so, just had the pan pizza. Everyone should try the pan pizza. It just came out. It's spectacular. Yeah. So we um, one another thing I wanted to talk about that seems amazing about Crispin is that um, you know you're looking at a future in which you know it's harder and harder to make any money, and you have stuff happening where you're partnering, you're developing products, you're partnering right. in products, you're. Um, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, you know, we, we've always seen advertising. We've never really looked at ourselves as like ad men in advertising. In other words, like we don't, we don't think of ourselves as just filling buckets of media. We're really looking to solve the problems of, uh, of our clients. And we think that starts with the product and then naming and packaging and point of sale, uh, website, social, and it builds its way out. And advertising is its last rung. And we've always engaged ourselves all the way right to the center of it uh, and pushed out. And we've, create, we've helped create products for clients. Chicken fries is one for uh, Burger King that we worked on. And we created channels for uh, satellite radio back in the day. And it was something that we've always just seen as part of what we do. Um, and so we've just started applying that in working with entrepreneurs. So when we talk about how are we going to continue to find ways to you know, make money and stay relevant, we thought we could use those skills and partner with entrepreneurs to create our own companies that we have an equity stake in. Absolutely. So we have one for B-Cycle, um, and it explains the whole thing. And it's also a really interesting product, which I wish well, because it look, you know, there's nothing. Thank you. It's, it's great for the environment also. Can we look at that, Sergey? Sergey? For far too long, America's transportation system has relied on gas-hungry cars that leave their owners stuck in traffic an average of 50 hours a year while costing them $8,000 to fuel and maintain. That's $9 billion in lost efficiency and 1.4 billion gallons of wasted fuel that produces 10,000 pounds of CO2 annually. So how could we help? Meet B-Cycle, America's first bike-sharing brand. Created in partnership between Humana, Trek, and Crispin Porter and Bogusky, Trek provides the bikes, Humana provides the funds, and CPB provides the brand, designed the parts, and programmed the ecosystem. It's the brand new Denver bike-sharing program, the first of its kind in the country. It's a clean and affordable way to get out of your car and ride. B stations, with their big bright Bs, make the stations feel familiar and inviting. Universal credit card checkout combined with the innovative locking system make it easy to grab and go. And the first 30 minutes are always free, making it hard to resist. And these certainly aren't your everyday bikes. For starters, riders never have to worry about storing, cleaning, inflating, oiling, or fixing them. And best of all, every B-Cycle is equipped with GPS to allow riders to track how many miles they ride and calories they burn. The entire system is completely integrated with web and mobile apps, 
to help riders find stations, popular bike routes, and even discounts at local merchants. Even more unconventional than Humana using its ad budget to create it is the fact that it's the cities that pay to install and maintain it. The first system was fittingly launched on Earth Day in Denver, Colorado. With such enthusiasm for the program, plans are already underway to expand the system with 500 more bikes and 50 more stations for 2011. I know Denver is doing this. How many other cities are getting ready to put bodies? There's a tremendous amount of interest around the country. Minneapolis is going to put a system in this year. Boston is working on putting a system in. Maybe your town is next. So do you need yeah. tremendous scale for that, you know, to actually make a profit or is make, you know, what, or? Yeah, I mean, I would say so. Yeah, we're at about 13 cities right now. So there, you know, there are a couple ways that you can turn a profit. Ultimately, you can it just, it's a business that self-sustains and makes money in that way. Or someone comes along, a larger, you know, bike sharing conglomerate or potentially a um, sort of street furniture uh, media company. In, in Europe, the, it's yeah, done by it's media Yeah, it's positively companies. Dutch, that thing. Yeah, it's yeah. great. Yeah. <laughs> so um, that's an, they might want to come and purchase that and for the advertising, the potential advertising revenue that could sit on the bikes and on the kiosks. And right, the and, yeah. and your agency built all of the, you know, the, the GPS in it. And yeah, the we did all in, the... In, in, we in designed taking it the, out and returning it. and Yeah, the stations themselves, we designed that. Uh, we have industrial designer uh, at the agency, and then we have developers that developed the entire ecosystem. Wow. And then designers that did all the design, and we've done all the sort of copy and naming and brand uh, building around it. So B cycle, it's, it's good. And all the Bs around the city are great. Yeah. A um, B. Yeah, hey B. Um, <laughs> is there is there another uh, digital campaign uh, that you wish the agency did that you really admire? Well, I was at Cannes and I was watching uh, and I was watching the show and this thing won um, called Fuel Band. Nike, uh, yeah. Yeah, and I thought, man, that's great. And I was sitting there next to my wife and we both looked at each other and we're like, we got to get that. And so we just responded to it like consumers and so. Um, I love quantifying everything I do and like getting credit for just walking around. Right, right. Because it um, reminded me on there, you can see your calories. Exactly. Um, yeah. So I've got I've got a fuel band here. Let's see how I'm doing today. If it's worth saying. Yeah. But not too bad. A thousand yeah. fuel points right yeah. now. Yeah. And there again, RGA ish mm -hmm. created it ish with Nike. You know, it came well, out a of lot the of agency ish. side. There's a lot of ish. Yeah, these because days, so frankly. many people are are a part of that, but. I was saying that you know I got a fuel ban, but I mostly sleep and I move very little, so you won't get it a lot of depressing. points for that. Yeah, your arm has to move like this. In order, yeah. So like, I cause immediately I tried to sort of break the system. You know, it's like yeah, I got it exactly. to make sure I was exercising, and then I'm like, ooh, maybe I could look like I'm exercising if I do this a yeah. lot. Yeah, but it doesn't. It, no, it that does works. Translate. So you can kind of cheat. Yeah. yeah. But why You're would cheating. you cheat? If exactly. The goal You're was cheating to get yourself, more... young man. Yeah. 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 You're only cheating yourself. Um, so <laughs> if you, if a, if a stranger from a strange land came back in 15 years, I mean, uh, 50, from 15 years ago, came back today, what would you say is the the biggest change in the last 15 years? I mean, there's so many changes, and so many have happened, you know, recently. I mean, you think about. Facebook and Twitter and all these things coming on just not you know not so long ago, but you know to me I if I think back 15 years and where you know my head was at and we've always looked at advertising differently, but I still think that brands and agencies felt like you could just have a two-dimensional sort of announcement style approach to the world, and now it's just far more complex. I mean, people want to know why you're doing something, not just what you're doing, you know. And I think about the complexity that's there and how the depth that's there and and it's a great time to be in advertising because there, there's so many things you can do build apps build start companies you know make movies uh, and make you know ads all at the same time so to me that's the it's the sort of it's the intimacy with which agencies and brands are connected in what we're doing together and the intimacy with which consumers and brands uh, have to be uh, connected it's just unacceptable any other way Wow. So nicely put and optimistically oh, put. Um, <laughs> how, what is speaking? You know, speaking of a very tough economy, and since you know the agency is part of a global group, and you have you have an Amsterdam. No, uh, we're in London, London and Sweden. Sweden. So, what do you see happening globally and locally in terms of the economy for agencies? Uh, you know, I think it's gonna. It's hard to say exactly, but I think it's gonna 
you know, continue to be a challenge. I mean, I think we like challenges, so it's not, it's, it's a good thing for us. We 